Hi there and welcome to another Worship with South Norwood Baptist Church, our online service. It's great to see you. My name's Pete. I'm the minister of the church. Wherever you're joining from today, we pray you'll be blessed and we will meet with God afresh as we celebrate, as we worship, as we pray together. It's great to have you with us. We're going to see some words from Psalm 33 to help us fix our eyes on God and remind us of his grace and his love to us. And then we're going to have some songs of worship. Do use this video however you can to help you worship and draw close to God. So, here's Psalm 33.
to know more about our church where we are who we are what we believe then do get in touch with us we'd love to hear from you or check out our website which is southnorthbaptist.org subscribe to this channel like this video so you don't miss any content and don't forget you can interact with us on social media platforms We're on facebook instagram and twitter we'd encourage you to not only watch but if you're in our area if you ever come to se25 do join us in our building. We gather from 10 for refreshment and then we worship together at 10.30 on a Sunday and we'd love to see you. Today as this premieres, it's the fourth Sunday of Lent. 
Sometimes that's known as the Tare Sunday, Sunday of Rejoicing, Rose Sunday even. But of course, commonly, we know it in the UK as Mothering Sunday. And so we want to say a massive thank you to those who care for us and nurture us, especially our mothers. Happy Mother's Day if that applies to you. And that's going to shape our prayers as we begin to pray in a moment. Praying for those who find today difficult, but also giving thanks to God for those who nurture us and care for us. We're aware that it's not an easy day for some, but for others it is a time of rejoicing. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for mothers. Lord, we thank you for those who care for us, whether they are biologically our mothers or not. We thank you for those who pass the faith to us. Lord, in the quiet, we give you thanks today. Lord, we remember those for whom today is a difficult day because of their own experiences, because of loss and trauma, because of the stuff of life. And we pray you'll comfort them at this time. Lord, we pray for mothers around the world. We are very aware of the situation in Ukraine. We pray for mothers whose children are fighting in the war. Pray for other places of conflict. Pray for other situations where mothers are burying their children, are facing the unthinkable. And we pray for peace. We pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, in quiet, we hold them before you. Bible reading today continues the story of Exodus and it's from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. 
Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with each person with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day through the seventh, must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, because it is on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And anyone, whether foreigner or native born, who eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door or of your houses until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land the Lord will give you, as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up! Leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said, and go, and bless, and also bless me. The Egyptians urged, urged the people to hurry and leave the country. For otherwise, they said, we will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading trousers wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord, the Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. 
The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. Many of the people went up with them, and also large droves of livestock, both flocks and herds. With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. The dough was was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. Now, the length of time the Israelites lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. We are making a movie about the story of Exodus so far. This will be the epic scene, the high point, the crunch, the great rescue, as part one of the story draws towards a close. The people of Israel were in Egypt, and it says in chapter one that they multiplied greatly. Started as one family, and now they've expanded, and the rulers, the pharaohs, they're unhappy about this. So they enslave the people. Moses is called to be the one to lead the people into freedom. But so far, Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, he's hardened his heart and he will not let the people go. That's despite the fact, as we were thinking about in our last session, there were nine blows or plagues, destructive things that came on the people and the land of Egypt. Even Pharaoh's own advisors say, we're ruined. But Pharaoh will not listen. And so the final blow is about to come. And in chapter 11, we read that Moses leaves Pharaoh hot with anger. I'm sure we can think of times when we've been hot with anger. And the reading we heard today intertwines the instructions for the specific night of what is about to happen but also for future generations to remember and to celebrate a feast. God is telling them how to remember something that hasn't even happened yet. They're still in Egypt because this was to be a new day, a new era, the start of a new season. John Golding gave remarks, Israel starts celebrating God's great act of deliverance before it even happens. Freedom was about to come. But how do we make sense of this story of Passover and what does it mean for us today? Firstly, it's about what they were saved from. The people of Israel, despite the blows, were still stuck. They were still slaves. They were still having to make bricks. They were still in the same situation. In chapter 1, it's described as they were worked ruthlessly with harsh labour. And that was before they had to make the bricks without the straw. And of course, we read about the slaughter of their baby boys thrown into the Nile, a kind of genocide moment. But God had reassured Moses, Exodus 6 verse 6, I will bring out, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Writer Christopher Wright suggests there are four areas and he uses these four things to sum up the totality of the experience of the Israelites in enslavement. He says it was political. The Israelites were an immigrant ethnic minority in a large imperial state. He says it's economic. Israelites were being exploited for slave labor on land not their own. Linked to that, it's social. The state-sponsored genocide, the fundamental denial of human rights. And fourthly, because of all this, it was spiritual. Slavery to Pharaoh was a massive hindrance to their worship of the God of their fathers. In their totality of existence, they were oppressed and under the thumb of Pharaoh, who thought he was a God. They were not free to serve the Lord doesn't take much imagination to think of people groups oppressed, even today. Israel had been in Egypt for what is described at the end of the reading we heard for 430 years. Now, whether that's a literal number or more symbolic number, it was many generations, a long time. But now God was about to act. The decisive final action of this scene was about to take place. And so the 
Israelites are given instructions for what was about to happen, both immediately and, as I said, for this future celebration. But for now, they need to think about the meal they're about to have and how it's to be prepared. The importance of the lamb and the blood of the lamb that we'll pick up in a moment. The need to stay in their houses for safety. And the sense of being ready, eat this meal, standing up with your cloaks on. Gird your loins, literally, be ready to go. If the blows, the plagues have been extreme so far for the people of Egypt, this was next level. Exodus 11 verse 5, God warns them, every firstborn son in Egypt will die. And yet through this terrible ordeal, Israel would be kept safe. And this would prove their moment of rescue by God. In the midst of the destruction that would come in Egypt to every household from Pharaoh at the top to the prisoners, it says in the text, God provided for his people. They will be saved, they will be freed, they will be rescued. In six of the previous plagues, we see how God differentiated between Israel and Egypt. So, for example, last week we thought of the plague of darkness. It was dark in the whole of Egypt, apart from in Goshen, where the Israelites were. The hail fell and destroyed everything in Egypt, apart from where the Israelites were. The plague on the cattle, all the animals, all the livestock died and was affected apart from the livestock of the Israelites. God differentiated without the people doing anything. They didn't have to hold their hands up or mark themselves. God knew who they were. But for this final blow, this final plague, God required them to act in faith, to obey his word. They were to take the blood of the lamb they killed for the meal and with the hyssop to Put it around their door frames, on the top and on the side. One writer describes this as a proclamation of who they are. They mark themselves as Israelites, not Egyptians. Now, different commentators explain this differently. Verse 13 says, the blood is a sign for you, for the people of Israel. And so one writer is clear, the blood was a sign to the people of God's deliverance of Israel, not for God to recognise which house to spare. After all, he knew who was his people. He knew which ones to spare previously. But other writers say this, this is a sign for Yahweh, for the Lord. And the passage does go on to say, after this is a sign to you, that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That this was more than just a sign simply for the people. Verse 23, when the Lord goes through the land, he will see the blood and he will not permit a destroyer to enter your houses. But why blood? Because the blood of the lamb, and that could mean a kid goat, blood of a young animal, lamb goat, it was essentially a substitute. It was a sign that something had died so that the firstborn could be saved. Back in Genesis, we know the story of Abraham who takes his son Isaac up the hill. And it seems like something really weird and cruel is going to happen and then God provides the sacrifice, a substitute. And that is what is happening here. There are echoes of that story. The blood of a substitute which God provides for his people. A spot this lamb. Death visits every house. But for the houses of Israel, the blood of the lamb means that judgment doesn't come. Mocha notes, the blood smeared around the doors of the Israelite house was a visible token that a life had been laid down in that place. The Passover lamb was for the meal, but it was so much more. There were pointers here too to the later sacrificial system and the sacrificial lamb as an atonement for sin. Some writers suggest this was about atonement and others suggest this is pointing forward to the idea of atonement. That one writer says this atones for the sins of the people, ransom in the firstborn males from death. While others suggest it's just looking forward to that. And that's certainly a picture used in the New Testament. Paul picks up the picture not just of the lamb but of the yeast of Passover itself the unleavened bread used here and he goes on to say Christ our Passover lamb 
has been sacrificed for us. But I'm jumping ahead. But God provides a substitute. By asking the people also to stay in their house, he provides a place of refuge. And it's interesting that the Hebrew word for house echoes the word for ark, as in Noah's ark, a place of safety. Safety from destruction, or to use the word we used last week, decreation. The God who creates life and the bringing of death. Salvation comes, a place of refuge and safety. And following this final blow, the people are free to leave. Even Pharaoh says, verse 31, leave. He said all the time, let my people go. No. And now he says, leave. And the Israelites leave. They take their stuff and they take all the treasures that they've been given from the Egyptians. Verse 42, the Lord kept vigil that night to bring them out of Egypt. Salvation, redemption has come. Freedom, let the people go. Of course, this story raises questions. Why did God do it this way? Is it right that these seemingly innocent people, innocent children, died? How do we make sense of that? Well, I think it's important that we wrestle with those questions. We acknowledge them. We don't just brush them aside. And they are hard to reconcile with the God that we know as the God of love. But there are a few things that can help us make sense of this, I think, in the story and in the wider scriptures. Firstly, Pharaoh had been warned. He's had nine other blows. And even before that, he'd been warned that this was going to happen. And so one writer says, the responsibility for the death of the Egyptian firstborn rests not with God, but with Pharaoh. He'd been told. He'd been warned. His actions had led to this point of no return. You can't refuse the word of God forever. There's also something in this story, in the scriptures, about the firstborn, the significance of the firstborn. Previously, Pharaoh had killed all the boys in Egypt, wiping out a generation. And in Exodus 4, Moses is told to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go, that he will worship me. But you refused, so I will kill your firstborn. Pharaoh had been more than as a sense of Israel as the firstborn of God. The firstborn was the heir, the chosen one, which interestingly, God sometimes flips. Moses was the younger, Aaron was the far, the, the older, the firstborn. Israel took his name from Jacob, who was the secondborn, but got the blessing that belonged to the firstborn in the story of Jacob and Esau. But there's something going on here with the firstborn, even Pharaoh's heir. This action is also described as judgment, not just against the people, but against the gods. So that in verse 12, makes it clear this will be a sign for the gods of Egypt. There's a spiritual dimension here too. As one writer says, the events of Passover are an awesome demonstration of God's holy judgment on Egypt and their false gods. Which leads us back to a phrase we heard earlier where Pharaoh wouldn't recognize who God is. I don't know Yahweh the Lord. Then you will know, says God, that I am the Lord. This is the final declaration both for Israel and Egypt of who is God. And of course, all the way through this is God's big story of rescue, of making a people for himself, for the blessing of the whole world, as hard as that is to make sense of. Which leads to our third point. The people were rescued out of Egypt. We might say they were saved by faith, by obeying the word of God. But it was through the blood. But it was not just about freedom from Egypt. It was freedom to be the people of God. And ultimately to go to the land God had promised them. God says to Moses in in Exodus 6, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. That's the rescue. I will free you for being slaves to them and I will redeem you. I will make you my own people and I will bring you to the land. Christopher Wright suggests this is freedom from slavery to covenant. Redemption was for relationship with the Redeemer. They were saved from but saved for a new purpose, a new identity. They were served, saved to serve 
the Lord and not Pharaoh. They could now worship freely and be the people that belonged to God. Shaped by the story, shaped by this rescue. So that as one writer says, Passover is not just an event from a nation's past. It's the event which shapes the present for Jewish people. So after the setbacks, the frustrations, the so many let my people go, no hardened hearts and difficulties, Moses leads the people to freedom. God has moved according to his covenant promise for his people. There is redemption, there is deliverance. Salvation from Egypt, from the social, political, economic and spiritual oppression into a new day. And God gives them this multi-century festival to remember and tell the story. And this event becomes the story for the people and shapes much of the story of the Bible because it foreshadows for us as Christians a rescue in Jesus, that we are saved from oppression and sin and everything. And we're saved by faith, by the blood of the Lamb, and was saved for to be the people of God. The Passover, says one writer, both models and anticipates a greater exodus that comes through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. See, the gospel writers tell us it was Passover time when Jesus was killed. It was Passover time when Jesus gave us, as Christians, a physical meal as he took the Passover meal and twisted it by saying, here is my body and here is my blood and you too eat and remember me, a meal of remembrance. Passover points us to the Lamb of God and the freedom we have. It points us to Jesus, the Rescuer, the Redeemer. Today we can know freedom, we can know hope, we can know rescue. Through the blood of Jesus, we can be his people in relationship with him because he died and rose again. In the Old Testament, redemption is the act of God, says Christopher Wright, in which he stands up as a great champion of his people, exerts his mighty strength and pays the full cost of rescuing them from all that opposes and oppress them. That's the story of God for his people then and now. May we know we are free, we are saved, we are the people of God. Lord, we thank you for this story of rescue. There are parts of it we struggle with. Help us to make sense and understand and to trust in your word. Help us to know Jesus died as the Lamb of God for us, that we might be saved. Amen. From the chaos of darkness, your word shaped the earth, and your image a people made. But we traded perfection, truth for a lie, and your glory was veiled in shame. But a promise made, a blessing you gave. To a people of your name For this broken world A saviour foretold To bear all our grief and pain When the heavenly sea Descended his throne, all my sin on his shoulders lay. And to win our redemption, he suffered and died for the sake of my guilt and shame. All the price he paid in taking my place, so that death.
When my heart is perfected, free from my sin, I will rest in your glorious grace. For the song we raise is the works of our hands, are in service of the King. When a thousand tongues cry glory to God, forever His praise we'll sing. As we draw towards the end of our video service, hopefully something is connected with you. If you'd like to know more about what it means that Jesus died as our substitute in our place, if you have questions about what you've heard, if you'd like to know more about being a Christian, do get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. We're going to pray now. Lord, may we know that you are God. May we worship you, Jesus, the Son who died. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Lead us this week, we pray. Amen. Back on this channel, Fan Midweek Thought, we put those out usually on a Wednesday. You can catch up with previous teachings. As I say often at the end of these videos, do reach out to someone. If you're from our church, say hi, encourage someone. God bless, keep in touch, and take care.